Hello everyone, good afternoon, welcome to this uh, third lecture in our program on the modern novel. My name is Fuzi Slisli and I will be your instructor. In the last, in the first two lectures we looked at the uh, subject of modernism, we looked at the characteristics of modernism, we looked at the background, the historical background that led to the development of modernist ideas. Uh, we looked at some definitions of the movement and we looked at the characteristics of modernist literature and modernist art. Today I propose to look at a famous modernist novel uh, and we'll try to see how some of the ideas we uh, discussed about modernism apply or do not apply on some modernist novels or modernist texts. So, the novel that I propose to look at is Animal Farm by George Orwell. It's a very famous novel uh, that provoked uh, extensive discussion in the 20th century. So, the title is Animal Farm. The author is George Orwell. And it's a novel. As far as the genre is concerned, um, it's, a it's a political satire and an allegory, and we'll explain each one later on. Uh, it was first published in August 17, 1945, so the end of the Second World War. The setting of the novel, the novel takes place in Mr. Jones' Manor Farm. It's a farm. And the main characters are Old Major, Snowball, Napoleon, Squealer, Boxer, Molly, Benjamin, Moses, Jones, Frederick, and Pilkington. Uh, just a brief word about political satire and allegory. Political satire is a work of literature that satirizes, uh, takes a comical, a critical and comical attitude to important political subjects. So at the same time there is a comical effect, but at the same time there is biting criticism of a political situation. It's called political satire. And allegory is usually a story that's a representation of life. So the best example usually are animal stories, uh, like the Persian and Arabic Khalil uh, Dimna, Ibn al-Muqaffa, uh, where we have stories about animals, with animals as, as characters, and, uh, and the story present to us a society of animals. But this society of animals is a representation of human society. And these animal characters are representations of human uh, characters. So this is the allegory, more or less. Um, the three most important aspects of Animal Farm, you know, just for the sake of simplification, we're going to say that Animal Farm has three most important aspects. First of all, Animal Farm is an allegory, which is a story in which concrete and specific characters and situations stand or represent other characters and situations, so as to make a point about them, right? So a set of characters stand for or represent another set of or s characters or situations to make a point or a critique about them. The main action of Animal Farm stands for the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the early years of the Soviet Union. Um, so the story is about animals and a farm and animal characters, but it stands, it represents the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the early years of the Soviet Union. Animalism is really, I mean, the novel talks about animalism, but animalism really is just communism, right? It's a reference to communism. Maynard Farm is an allegory for Russia, and the farmer, Mr. Jones, is the Russian Tsar, is a, is, is a representation of the Russian Tsar who will be thrown out after the revolution. Old Major stands for either Karl Marx or Vladimir Lenin, 
who are the ideological uh, leaders of the Soviet Revolution. And with Lenin, he is even the political leader of the Soviet Revolution. And the pig named Snowball represents the intellectual revolutionary Leon Trotsky, while Napoleon stands for Stalin, while the dogs are his secret police. The horse boxer stands in for the proletariat or the working class. <clears throat> the setting of Animal Farm is a dystopia. Um, this is an important characteristic of Animal Farm. It's a dystopia. A dystopia, it's an imagined world that is far worse than our own. So, uh, we have a situation of a poet or a writer or a novelist that imagines, writes a story that's set in the future and imagines our world in a worse shape than what it is on now. So dystopias are, in a way, very pessimistic stories. They try to predict what the future is going to be and give us a story set in that future. And it's a very bleak and not very nice future. So it's dystopian. So um, the opposite of dystopia is a utopia. When writers write about a, a future world with optimism and they portray a world in the future that's much better than our own, we call that a utopia, right? Like stories that tell us about uh, there will come a day when everybody will be free and everybody will be happy and everybody will have enough to eat and a place to live and there will be no war. This is a utopia. But a story that tells us about a world where things will be far worse than what they are now, we call that a dystopia. Um, other dystopian novels include Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, that's a very famous one, and Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, or George Orwell's own 1984. All these three novels are examples of dystopia. And as you can imagine, as you can see, the 20th century dystopia was very popular in the 20th century. Uh, modernism as a movement tried to uh, take a hard look and be honest and brutally honest about the future that humanity is looking at to. And to be brutally honest, um, writers and artists did not see a reason to be hopeful. They were very hopeless and uh, had a very dystopian view of the future of humanity. Third, the most, imp the most famous line from the book is, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Th this is the most famous line from the novel Animal Farm. Animal Farm. This line is emblematic of the changes that George Orwell believed followed the 1917 communist revolution in Russia. Rather than eliminating the capitalist class system, right, this revolution uh, was intended to eliminate the capitalist class system, but instead the Russian revolution merely, merely replaced it with another hierarchy and another system. The line is also this line, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others, is also typical of Orwell's belief that those in power usually manipulate language to their own benefit. I want to give you a brief chapter by chapter summary. Chapter 1, 12 years old major, 12 years, 12 years old major, this is old major, he is uh, the Mainers Farms prize winning boar. He calls a meeting of all the animals to talk about the difficulty of their lives and their man's rule. He reveals his dream and prophecies a future rebellion of animals against men, teaching the animals a song called Beasts of England. In chapter 2, Old Major dies, 
but the other animals, led by two young boars named Snowball and Napoleon, these two keep the idea of a future rebellion against human beings alive. On Midsummer's Eve, one Midsummer's Eve, Mr. Jones becomes too drunk to feed or care for the animals, and the hired hands forget them as well. The animals break into the grain bins. When Mr. Jones and the hired hands appear, the animals attack and drive them off the farm. The animals are now in control of Manor Farm. They change its name to Animal Farm and establish their own rules for behavior which are painted on the wall of the barn. So we have a situation in which animals start a revolution, throw the human beings out, and the animals take power and establish their own government. Chapter 3. The farm animals supervised by the pigs now harvest the crops with better results than ever before. Sundays are established as days of rest or they're used for meetings and for singing Beasts of England. So we see that this animal society starts getting organized. They have a day off today, which wasn't the case before. Having already taught themselves to read and write, the pigs attempt to teach these skills to other animals. Committees are established, such as the Clean Tails League for the cows are set up, but none are successful. These committees are all failure because most of the animals cannot learn to read or to memorize the seven commandments. The commandments are reduced to one simple maxim. And the simple maxim is, four legs good, two legs bad. Napoleon takes nine puppies for private instruction. He takes nine little dogs, puppies. He said, you know, I'm going to take these for my own private. I will teach them myself and educate them myself. And the, big, and the pigs are now the only ones allowed to eat the apples and drink the milk produced on the farm. The pigs force the other animals to accept this by reminding them of the threat of Mr. Jones' return, right? Basically, the pigs are the only ones who eat the milk, who eat the, the apples and drink the milk. And when the other animals complain that that's not fair, that's not just, well, the pigs just scared them that if, you know, uh, that the pigs are important because they do brain work because it's the hardest work, it's brain work. And if they don't uh, nourish themselves with milk and apples, the brain work will not be done, and the threat of Mr. Jones returning becomes bigger and bigger. So, you know, the other animals consent and allow the pigs to eat the apples and drink the milk. In chapter 4, the song Beasts of England is now being hummed and sung over half of the country although no other farm have joined the rebellion. Armed with a shotgun, Mr. Jones and several men from town attempt to recapture the farm, but Snowball leads the animal in successfully defending it. Medals for bravery are awarded to Snowball, Boxer, and the one sheep killed in the battle. Mr. Jones' gun is set up at the foot of a flagpole and it will be fired on the anniversaries of the rebellion and the newly renamed Battle of the, Co of the Cowshed. Chapter 5, Molly, the horse, is seen consorting with humans who have petted her and given her sugar and ribbons. When Clover, the draft horse, confronts her, Molly abandons Animal Farm and the rebellion altogether and goes and joins the humans. Meanwhile, Snowball wants the animals to build a windmill that will provide, he says, electricity, heat, and running water in each stall. But Napoleon disagrees with the idea and urinates on Snowball's diagrams. When Snowball tries to present his idea to uh, the animals at their weekly meeting, Napoleon reveals the nine dogs he has trained, he was hiding until then, as attack dogs, and the dogs drive Snowball from the farm. When some animals protest, the sheep 
drown, uh, the sheep drown the protest uh, by bleating four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad. And the dogs growl menacingly. So, in a way, Napoleon soon tells the animals they are going to build a windmill and that it has always been his ideas, not snowball. With the aid of three glowing dogs, Squealer convinces the animals to believe this. So what we have here in chapter 5 is a coup, right? A coup is staged by Napoleon. He takes power by force using the eight dogs he has been training as attack dogs and chases Snowball out of the farm and establishes himself as the sole only ruler of Animal Farm. And Napoleon uses Squealer, the other pig, to convince the, animal, the animals that this is all right and, and correct. Chapter 6, although they are working a 60-hour week, including Sunday afternoons, the animals are happy during the next, the next year. They believe they are working for themselves despite being threatened with half rations if they do not work on Sunday. Because of construction on the windmill, some crops are not planted on time, and the harvest is not nearly as good as last year's. The animals devise a way to break up the stone they need for the windmill. Boxer gets up early to work harder. The need for seeds and other supplies causes the pigs to begin trading with other farms, first selling a load of hay, but warning the hens that their eggs may have to be sold as well. Mr. Wimper, a solicitor living in Willingdon, serves as intermediary between Animal Farm and other farms. Squealer assures that animals uh, no resolution had ever been made forbidding trade with human beings. The pigs move into the farmhouse, and begin sleeping in, in beds. The fourth commandment now has been changed. It says, no animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets. Before that, it used to say, no animal shall sleep in a bed. Now it says, no animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets. With the dog's aid and the threat of Jones's return, Squealer convinces the animals that the rule had always referred to sheets and not about sleeping in beds. When the half-built windmill blows down during a storm, Napoleon accuses Snowball of destroying it and orders the animals to begin rebuilding it. Chapter 7. Always cold and usually hungry, the animals labor and work to rebuild the windmill over the long, hard winter. Napoleon rarely leaves the farmhouse Squealer makes all his announcements and informs the hens they must produce eggs to sell so that grain can be bought for the animals to eat. The rebellious hens, led by three pullets, go on strike laying their eggs from the rafters to smash on the floor. Napoleon starves them into submission and nine hens die before the rebellion is over. So this is a little rebellion by the hens, but Napoleon... Napoleon crashes it. Anything that goes wrong on the farm is blamed on Snowball. Squealer again counts on the growling dogs and Boxer's belief that whatever Napoleon says is right to, to persuade the animals that Snowball had always been in league with Jones and was a traitor at the Battle of the Cowshed. He warns them that there may be other animal traders in their rank. Few days later, Napoleon calls a meeting in which the dogs attack the four pigs who had earlier protested Snowball, Snowball's guilt. Under pressure, they confess to spying for Snowball and the dogs quickly tear out their throats. The hand ring leaders of the strike, of, of the strike confess as do several other animals, and all are promptly killed. When the shocked animals gather together for comfort and sing Beasts of England, Squealer silences them 
and states that the song has been abolished. It is unnecessary now that the rebellion has been achieved. When some attempt to protest, the sheep's bleeds drown them out until discussion time has passed. In chapter 8, when some of the animals think to check the commandments, they find that the sixth now reads, No animal shall kill any, anim any other animal without cause. So the expression without cause has been added because before it used to say, No animal shall kill any other animal, period. Now, all of a sudden, the commandment, the sixth commandment, reads differently. No animal shall kill any other animal without cause. That means that if there is a cause, an animal can kill another animal. And the poor animals don't remember if, I mean, sometimes they say, oh, you know, we remember it was different, but Squealer is very quick and very good at using language to make them doubt themselves and to make them believe that no, the commandment was always like that and it's just their imagination. So they accept the deaths of those animals as perfectly reasonable in light of the rule. Though the animals are working harder than ever, they wonder if they are any better off than they were under Mr. Jones. Yet Squealer quotes figures, Squealer always brings numbers and figures that seemingly support his statements that production has increased and life has improved. Now when Napoleon appears, he is attended by the dogs and a black cockerel. Black cockerel who marches in front and crowds before Napoleon speaks. Napoleon has his own apartment, eats from the best china, has two dogs to wait on him and orders that the gun be fired on his birthday. In chapter 9, uh, the windmill is finally uh, finished. Sorry, in chapter 8, also the windmill is finally finished. Napoleon sells a stack of lumber to Frederick the owner of the farm next door, and insists on being paid in five pound notes. After the lumber is carted away, the pigs discover the money is counterfeit. It's fake. Frederick and his men then attack Animal Farm. Armed with rifles, the men force the animals to flee. Only Benjamin realizes they are going to blow up the windmill. When it is destroyed, the animals throw caution to the wind and attack Frederick's man, who kills several of the animals and wounds the others. After the animals chase the man off the farm, Napoleon orders that Jones' rifle be fired in a victory celebration. The injured boxer questions the victory, but Squealer assures him they have won back their farm and will rebuild the windmill. In celebration, the animals are given extra food. The, pig, the pigs discover a case of whiskey and they get very drunk. The next day, a hangover, a hangover squealer announces that Napoleon is dying. When Napoleon recovers, he sends for books on brewing and distilling and orders the field originally designated as the grazing plot for retired animals to be plowed up and planted with barley, which is what, you know, is used to produce either beer or whiskey. The fifth commandment now reads, no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. Again, this is another, amend, another commandment that changes because in the beginning it just said no animal shall drink alcohol, period. Where now it says no animal shall drink alcohol to excess, which means as long as it's not to excess, uh, animals can drink alcohol. So the pigs are having fun with alcohol. They changed the rules and now they're drinking alcohol. In chapter 9, although Boxer was injured in the battle, he still works as hard as ever on <coughs> rebuilding the windmill. 
the animals are colder and hungrier than last winter. But Squealer again recites statistics to assure them that even with the readjustment of rations, they are still much better off than when Jones run the farm. Since most of the animals cannot remember what life under Jones was like, they believe him. 31 baby pigs now wear green ribbons on their tails on Sundays and are taught by Napoleon who has plans to build a schoolhouse. The pigs, fatter than ever, have learned to brew beer and receive a daily ration of it. Once a week, the animals participate in a spontaneous celebration to celebrate the struggles and triumphs of Animal Farm, which helps them forget their hunger and their misery. The farm is declared a republic, and Napoleon, the only candidate, is elected president. Moses, the raven, returns with his tales of Sugar Candy Mountain uh, and is allowed to stay. Uh, Moses is, represents the clergy or the, or the religion, if you want. He, he used to, when Mr. Jones still controlled the farm, Moses, notice the name Moses, following the prophet Moses, he used to talk to animals about sugar candy land, which is a land that animals go to after they die, and it's full of land, full of milk and honey and sugar and uh, everything that the animals like. So now he's back and he's allowed to stay. Hard-working boxer finally collapses. He believes he and Benjamin now will be allowed to retire. However, the wagon that comes to take him to the hospital actually belongs to the horse slaughter. When Benjamin convinces the others of Boxer's danger, it is too late. Bo uh, Boxer is too feeble to break out on the wagon on his own. Several days later, Squealer announces that Boxer has died in the hospital and has been buried in town. He reassures them, the animals uh, he has, he, wa he was there right at the end. He assures the animals that he was there uh, at, on, on his side at the end and that Boxer died saying Napoleon is right. Uh, Squealer explains away the wagon and assures that the animals, uh, a memorial banquet will be held for Boxer. On the day of the celebration, a case of whiskey is delivered to the pigs who have somehow found money to pay for it. Where did they bring the money from? Chapter 10. Over the, the years, most of the animals who took part in the rebellion have died, leaving only Clover, Benjamin, Moses and several of the pigs. None of the animals have ever been allowed to retire Many animals have been born who have little knowledge of the rebellion and those bought by the farm have never heard of it at all. The farm flourishes. The windmill is used to grind corn and another is being built. The animals have been told they don't need the hot and cold water and electric lights they thought they would have once the windmill was built. Napoleon tells them the truest happiness lay in working hard and living frugally. There are many more pigs and dogs and even though they do not produce food, their appetites are big and hearty. The overworked animals often suffer from hunger and cold. However, they never lose sight of the truth that they are members of a free republic, members of Animal Farm, the only farm owned and run by animals. They still hope and believe in Major's Republic of uh, the animals when all of England will be free of mankind. Squealer takes the sheep away and teaches, and teaches them a new slogan. To the horror of the other animals, the pigs begin to walk on two legs and the sheep drown out their protests with the newly, the newly learned slogans, four legs good, two legs better. 
So it used to be four legs good, two legs bad. Now it has become four legs good, two legs better. There is only one commandment now. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. The pigs dress in the Mr. Jones clothing now, and nearby farmers come for a tour of the farm. The farmers comment favorably on the fact that the animals work longer hours and are fed less than their own animals. Napoleon announces that he is abolishing several practices at the farm, such as the use of the word comrade on Sunday marches and the horn and hoof symbol of, on the flag. The farm will re resume its original name, uh, the Manor Farm, as the animals peep in the farm, farmhouse window to their amazement, they can no longer tell who are the pigs and who are the humans. Um, so this is the story, the major character list uh, here. We have Old Major, he's an old boar whose speech about evils perpetrated by humans rouses animals into rebellion. His philosophy concerning the tyranny of man is named animalism by his followers. He also teaches the song Beasts of England to the animals. And uh, you have a list here of the, uh, all the characters available that, that are uh, present in the story. Snowball, Napoleon, Squealer, Boxer, Molly, Benjamin, Moses, uh, Mr. Jones. You have the, there's the humans also, Mr. Jones. Uh, and Mr. Wimper, Mr. Pilkington, and Mr. Frederick. So, this brings us to an end to this uh, lecture on Animal Farm. I hope you find it an entertainment and provocative text that, you know, will make you think and uh, in terms of the uh, 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 in terms of the events and the characters and the plots. And remember, this is also an allegory. So it's a story that should stand for stories in real life. So think about it and look for elements of modernism in the story. Thank you.